All right, we're going to jump in, and uh, as others uh, join, they'll just miss the exciting introductory banter. But uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, for being with us here this afternoon. I appreciate you joining us for what we anticipate will be a really good conversation. Uh, my name is Craig Shelley. I'm, I'm the managing director at Org Group. Um, gathered here today with a dynamic panel of uh, really some 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 fantastic people that my colleague Kelly will introduce you to in a moment. Um, but just wanted to sort of frame a little bit about where we're going and, and why we've gathered today. Um, those of you uh, that have joined us previously know that we've kind of been on a series of conversations since the, the pandemic started about various things that have been top of mind. Um, over the last few weeks, um, we've invited you into conversations that we've been having for about the last 18 months around sort of how does diversity, equity, and inclusion really play a role in the nonprofit sector? And probably more importantly, how has it not played a role um, to date. Um, we don't uh, pretend to have answers to any of that, but wanted you to join the conversations we're having with people that are helping us get to answers. Um, and that's a little bit about what we're doing today. Um, I think, you know, really the way we've thought about this is, you know, there's a series of questions that we've been been asking, um, and then we're going to kind of drill down into sort of board leadership and, and staff makeup and donor pipelines. But, you know, sort of broadly, we've been thinking around like, you know, why are nonprofit leaders and board members not, you know, more representative of the, of the communities they serve? Um, is a fundraising field that's predominantly, you know, white and cisgender, uh, is that actually disenfranchising donors who, who would want to be part of the process but, but, but aren't? Um, are there better solutions in the sector that, you know, we're just missing out on because it's the same group of people sitting around the table talking to each other with the same background? Um, and then really, as we got a little bit more narrow, you know, our firm has always prided ourselves on teamwork and recognized that working together as teams, that diversity of view that we were able to bring together is how we got better answers and sort of the realization that, yeah, our team is diverse in terms of like there's numbers of people on it, but it's not diverse often in the viewpoints or the backgrounds that people are coming from. Um, so how do we unlock, you know, what really we see as the value of teamwork um, and just what can we as a firm be doing better in the sector, right? We're positioned in a way that we work with lots of nonprofits. Um, are we doing enough? The answer is no. So how do we do more? Um, that's the conversation we've been having. Um, and uh, we're excited for you to join us today. A couple of housekeeping things before Kelly sort of kicks us off. Um, if you have questions, there's a little Q&A box on the bottom. Um, you can click that, enter in the question. Um, we'll try and work it into the conversation. Um, make sure we get to it. Uh, there's also the chat function. The chat function, if you want to um, sort of, if you have a tech problem, for sure, put it there. Um, or if you just want to kind of say hello, tell us where you're from, um, or any generic, uh, hey, that's an amazing introduction, Craig, you're doing a great job. Any of that stuff you could put, put, in, the, put in the chat. Um, and with no further ado, I'll turn you to my, uh, my colleague, Kelly Dunphy, um, who I've had the pleasure to work uh, with for the last seven years. And um, well, there's a great story of how I used to bang a ball against the wall between our offices, but we solved that by we don't have offices anymore. So uh, Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Craig. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Dunphy. I'm a managing director here at Org Group. Um, I've been with the firm for uh, over 10 years now. Um, been in fundraising since the day I graduated college, though. For 20 years now, I've been a fundraiser. So um, excited to talk about such an important issue today and um, to introduce our panelists. We have two really excellent leaders uh, with us today. And I'll start by introducing Marco Davis who is the president and CEO of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute, which is a national nonprofit that is dedicated to developing the next generation of Latino leaders. Um, the Institute provides public service, and, public service and policy experiences to Latinx students and young professionals. Um, and they've created a network of over 4,000 highly, highly accomplished alumni at this point. Um, the, they also convene members of Congress and other public officials, corporate executives, nonprofit leaders, et cetera, to discuss issues facing the nation and the Hispanic community in particular. Uh, prior to joining the Institute, he was a partner at New Profit, which is a national nonprofit venture philanthropy, where he led an effort to create a more equitable social sector and served as the organization's lead on diversity, equity, and inclusion. He also served in the Obama administration as Deputy Director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, um, and also as Director of Public Engagement for Corporation for National Community Service. Um, was also with um, Ashoka's Youth Venture, 
um, and uh, formerly National Council of La Raza, now known as Unidos US. Um, he serves on a number of boards, such as independent sector, education leaders of color, um, National Hispanic Leadership Agenda, um, and he's a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, a graduate of Yale University, um, originally from New York, and now a resident of the District of Columbia, where he lives with his family. Thank you, Marco, for joining us today. Um, and then also we have Elliot Gaskins, who's with Share Our Strength, which is the organization that launched No Kid Hungry to ensure that no child in America goes hungry. And they do that by opening access to um, existing solutions, including school breakfasts, after school meals and summer meals. Um, and that's just uh, part of what they do. They do such wonderful work in many uh, um, different areas. But what's really interesting of, of late is that as millions of vulnerable children um, lost the healthy meals they depend on as the pandemic closed schools nationwide. So really that venue for those um, meal opportunities for kids facing hunger, Share Our Strength is really on the front lines and they experience an unprecedented response from their donors, both um, old and new. Um, and so far in the millions, tens of millions of dollars they've raised, they've now sent back $27 million into the community in emergency relief to schools and groups across all 50 states, plus Puerto Rico, the district and Guam. Um, and so with those funds in partnership with No Kid Hungry's guidance are really, uh, they're helping to serve nearly 11 million meals a day during this crisis. Um, and they have more money to grant by the end of the year. So they're really doing amazing work in this area. And Elliot is the Managing Director of Development at Share Strength, where he oversees um, the team across the country focused on major gifts, both from individuals and foundations. And he's really played a leading role in building that team over the last several years. Um, they execute fundraising dinners and cultivation events across the country. They're building um, a wide uh, array of donors in a um, really solid portfolio. Um, and he is the lead on building out those multi-year plans and strategies to significantly grow the revenue. And prior to joining the Share Our Strength team, um, he's worked at some of the premier nonprofit organizations in the country, including the Aspen Institute, Alzheimer's Association, the Nature Conservancy, um, and America's Promise Alliance. Um, and uh, he is a proud native of Philly. Um, so really East Coast strong on this call today. Um, he's a graduate of Temple University, um, was an All-American athlete in track and field, and he now resides in Virginia with his family. So we're really excited to have you both with us today. And um, I wanted to start um, by just a larger kind of question before we get into some of the specific areas we want to focus on. But Marco, you've been a voice on DEI in the nonprofit sector for, for many, many years now. What have been some of the biggest challenges for the sector in becoming a more diverse and equitable space? And, and what, if anything, feels different about this moment? Yeah, so um, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Great to see you all. Um, uh, I would say, I think in some ways, I think the biggest challenge prior to now has been, frankly, sort of a fundamental lack of recognition of the problem, right? I think folks um, prior to now, um, often you couldn't even get started in some of these efforts because there was, a, whether it was sort of an outright denial of the problem or sort of a misunderstanding of what the problem was and what the issues were, right? Um, you had uh, in the nonprofit sector, sadly, much like in the private sector, as evidenced by some extremely, to be generous, inartful uh, comments by the CEO of Wells Fargo, right? Simply saying, we cannot find enough talented uh, uh, candidates of color, which is frankly laughable, right? But, um, uh, but, but was still a, a, a surprisingly widely held kind of uh, opinion and perspective on the one hand. To the other hand, folks saying, well, we're doing our best, we're trying, and that should count for something, right? In some ways, it was this very um, uh, uh, charitable, but sadly sort of vague and, and I would argue half-hearted, although they, I'm sure, felt that they were being sincere, um, efforts that had no real metrics, right? And, and so underneath all of this, there weren't real numbers uh, that were widely known, that were widely discussed, although some folks like the Council on Foundations in Philanthropy, for example, uh, had been tracking numbers for 20 years. Um, 
folks were not familiar with them, folks didn't call on them, folks didn't hold those up as examples. And so um, in my mind that, you know, and then, sim and then similarly, I think even in some of the more uh, arguably less concrete, right? So that's diversity in numbers. That's just actually having people at the table. That's before you get into sort of more subtle nuances of questions of inclusion, much less questions of equity. Similarly sort of felt, you know, the arguments were, were kind of, again, not super well grounded um, in sort of people saying, but we have a very welcoming culture. We're absolutely open. Like no one here is like overtly racist. And it's like, well, that's good. <laughs> Certainly a precursor. Uh, but, but as people like to say, that's necessary, but insufficient, right? Like that didn't necessarily mean that you had an actually inclusive culture that didn't necessarily mean, right? And again, and people weren't doing data tracking to recognize that, oh, we seem to have this revolving door that spins much faster for our staff of color than it does for our white staff, right? We seem to have um, fewer people of, of color, for example, moving up the ranks in, into leadership roles in our organization than we do non, right? And sometimes the excuse was, well, we're a small organization and we don't have that many staff. So it's hard to really have a good end to compare. But, you know, again, but then often the answer could easily be, but you've got 10 years of data. So what's really the excuse? Right. And again, people didn't look at patterns. I could go on, but I won't. I know we only have a limited time. The, the last thing I'll say is um, uh, what's different now. So what's yeah. different now is I think, as I've heard people refer to it, right, is the three pandemics. I think people are referring to it now. Right. We have COVID-19 um, specifically affecting people health and, and, and what it's revealed about disparities and discrepancies in, in society, coupled with the economic pandemic, if you will, the economic uh, calamity that is sort of the shutdown of the economy and the loss of jobs and unemployment, and again, which has disproportionately affected people of color. And then, of course, we have sort of the pandemic that was longstanding, but that really came to the surface of sort of systemic racism, right? And so I think the difference now is that people, many, many, many more people are, are understanding that there are some things in our systems and in our society that are fundamentally broken and that those things need to be addressed. And that's created the space to have a much more honest and profound and far reaching conversation around things like diversity, equity, inclusion, and why that matters and how to address it. Great, thank you. Um, Elliot, thinking about Share Our Strength, how did DEI fit into the organization's values and strategy and what feels different since late May? Thanks, Kelly. Well, first I wanna thank the org group for having a space to have these important conversations. It is one thing to say that this is an important moment and an important time for our country, but it's another thing to act and to really try to have some constructive dialogue. So hats off to you and the organization for providing the space to, to have this opportunity. Um, I'll answer your question, but I'll start with the general premise because what Marco just said was really interesting about something being fundamentally, fundamentally broken about the system. The problems of the nonprofit sector are more so the challenges of society at large. Unequal treatment, unequal access, biases. Those are challenges in the larger society. Some of the most progressive nonprofits in the country are unconsciously, unknowingly supporting a, a, lot, of these, a lot of these actions. I've worked at some of the, and, and engaged at some of the highest levels from the standpoint of fundraising and donors. I know for a fact that there are some donors that will not respond to me and they respond to my white colleagues differently. That says that in my mind, that has less to do with the nonprofit sector and more to do about the state of our country. Are there things that we need to address in the nonprofit sector? 1000%, but it's very, very much integrated in what is happening in a larger culture, a larger society. And my hope is that the nonprofit sector can be a model to influence what the larger culture can eventually get to. Um, from the standpoint of how we view uh, as share our strength, uh, demanding diversity is a core principle of our organization. We have five principles. Demanding diversity is core to that. Inclusivity, inclusiv inclusivity, <laughs> if I can say that word, <laughs> is not a and that's representing in our grant making that I can talk about sort of in a little bit more. 
and is represented in its staffing and how we hire and bring or, uh, staff into our organization. Um, so it's core to our beliefs. It's not something that just will happen organically. We are intentionally focused on having this a core element of every single discussion that has the organization. And we have gotten better at it and we will continue to get better at it. What feels different about this moment is that uh, there's a high level of visibility and urgency because of the Looks like we lost Elliot there. Oh, can you hear us? Oh, are, back. are we still there? Okay, perfect. Yeah, we're there. You're there. You're back. We lost you there. We lost so you there for the, a couple. Of yeah. Sorry about that. So I would just close to say we feel like because of the greater visibility, there's a greater responsibility to uplift and and, and raise a voice about these important issues. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously everything that's been said so far, I mean, fantastic points and a great way to sort of frame this, but but Elliot, just to jump off a couple of things that you said, like this idea that the nonprofit sector is in fact just kind of a microcosm of what's going on in the whole world, that's like so obvious, but at the same time, such a thing that the sector has denied, right? Like we've always held ourselves as sort of outside and better and like, oh, this is Coca-Cola's problem. It's not, you know, the name XYZ national, you know, brand nonprofits charity or, or challenge. So I think that's sort of like one thing for us all to accept. But then I like your idea of like, how do we become sort of the incubator of how organizations of all type, you know, can, 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 can do this better. And, you know, and maybe we're not better than everybody else, um, like we like to tell ourselves, but maybe we can be, right? Like maybe we can get there first because we are more well-intentioned and, you know, maybe we are a little less restricted. But so like, I always think in terms of like an organization, you know, any kind of organizational culture really stops at the top, right? So if we're gonna create sort of change in nonprofits, it's really gotta start there at the top, right? So in my mind, it's like donors become board members, board members hire the CEO, the CEO hires the staff, the staff goes gets, goes, gets more donors, and it's this sort of huge cycle. Um, so if we start that with all guys that look like me, we're gonna sort of have that sort of go throughout the cycle. Um, and, you know, you look at the stats, 10% of board chairs, 16% of board members or people of color in the last study I saw, like, it just, I mean, you can see exactly where the, the, pro the problem is starting. Um, so I guess, you know, Marco, I want to ask you, like, we're all sort of here, table stakes, this is a good idea. But, like, let's get more specific. You know, when you've seen organizations actually led by people of color, how do you see the work benefiting? Like, how is that organization functioning in a, in a better and different way? That sort of is like, wait a minute, yeah, that's what we need to start doing. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So I, I, I'd answer that maybe two ways. One, um, one is that <clears throat> it's it's in fact now proven in the private sector with with extensive studies. I think McKinsey and Company being one of the main ones, right, that has shown that uh, entities with a diverse leadership team are actually more successful, more more effective. In the private sector, they've actually been proven to be more profitable than their peers, right? And that the, the, those studies are starting to be extended now into the nonprofit sector, although obviously it's not as easy to compare apples to apples uh, in our sector in terms of results and outcomes, right? And, and definitions of effectiveness. But thankfully there's enough of a body of work that shows that like it's better on, on just a variety of ways, profitability just being one good easy measure in the, non in the private sector. Um, that shows <clears throat> that shows that, and and part of the reason behind that it's worth noting is it's not this you know sort of magical idea um, is that you get a broader variety of perspectives right of ideas of opinions you get folks the the extremely cliched idea now of thinking outside the box like that's what that means you get folks who come at problems from an entirely different lens from an entirely different worldview, from entirely different lived experience. And so particularly in the nonprofit sector, folks who can come into leadership and think strategically about the work that is attempting to be done when so many nonprofit organizations are trying to help people in need or help communities who are underrepresented, who have been under-resourced, who have been neglected sometimes by systems and societies or who fall outside of traditional uh, processes, right? How to resolve that, um, you need uh, if, if the solutions were simple and obvious, in some cases, um, they probably would have been <laughs> developed already and would have been accomplished, right? And so what you need is that creativity, you need that inventiveness. And so in that sense, that's beneficial. Um, more specifically, uh, what you have, particularly uh, when you talk about uh, at the leadership level, is um, 
you also get the benefit of folks who have some insight or have the potential at least to have some insight into the experiences of the population served. You have folks who have greater proximity to the issues, to the challenges, right? And whether the, the individuals have lived it themselves or have seen it themselves um, uh, is part of the factor, but it's also folks who are familiar or who have had some analog experience um, at a minimum in terms of experiencing bias, right? As we were just talking about experiencing and sadly of experiencing discrimination, even some of the wealthiest and most successful leaders of color still talk about the fact that they get handed car keys at the valet, right? And there's, there's and, and that's like the benign example, um, right? But so, and far worse, sadly, right? And so folks who have had exposure to some of those vulnerabilities, some of those challenges, some of that frankly, injustice, um, are able to then bring that perspective to the table. And the last, and so I guess it was more than two, but the last couple of points I'll mention are um, there is a often a noticeable shift in the power dynamics as well, right? What often happens that people um, don't intend and certainly people don't love, but people I think haven't thought of or haven't been able to sort of address the solution of is sort of the outsider slash sometimes, dare I say, the sort of savior syndrome, syndrome of folks who are completely from a different experience, walk of life, uh, a perspective, et cetera, being the ones controlling the resources, making the decisions for a community, for a population, right? And that goes across, that, that, that goes in terms of uh, uh, racial and ethnic makeup and diversity, but it also, if you think about it, you can extend that idea, which is often the, at the heart of work around diversity, I can inclusion that it's not exclusively racial and ethnic diversity. It's often about an urban versus a rural upbringing. It's often about a highly competitive college experience versus a, a less competitive or no college experience. There's all these different factors and ways in which those uh, uh, differences are revealed in high contrast and particularly are perceived by the community being served as someone who doesn't come from their world and who may in fact not have any deep understanding of their world. And so the solutions even are sometimes better and faster accepted and adopted and embraced by the population being served uh, when folks can relate to them better, to put it in a, in a slightly crude or an overgeneralized way. So in my mind, those are some of the benefits and advantages of, of looking to ensure that you have a broader and more diverse group of leaders. Yeah, I and mean, I think that that sort of concept of proximity, which you know, I honestly first heard from Marco while we worked together at New Profit, like that sort of put me in the express lane on this whole topic, right? I was like, that's actually the thing, like particularly for nonprofits, that's the thing. Like, what the, I don't know anything about so many of these things we're dealing with, um, and we need people that do because they're just it's a different set of answers. Um, so, Elliot, you know, you've been around a lot of boards and a lot of big organizations. You know, what are the things that you've seen missing? You know, you've sort of said it, but I'll just name it. Right? Like, we're going to make the assumption they were not terribly diverse boards in many cases, right? Where, what things have you seen them missing because of that lack of lack of diversity? Well, I think Marco, you know, hit on a for the organizations I work with and probably many of the folks on this call is authentic lived experiences. That is as critical as anything, depending on your mission, but certainly many of the nonprofits we face, we have, we have things and we've all done it at organizations where you have impact trips, are things where you invite the donor to see, the, and board members to see the work up close in communities. We don't have have people authentically representing their communities, those kind of trips can appear voyeuristic. And it's a group of 50 plus year old white men standing around and, and looking at the community instead of being committed, embedded, and understanding the different nuances in that community. So those authentically lived experiences are so missing from so many nonprofits. And I know, you know, we are working hard to be better at that. It's your strength, but it's an issue that I think we all need to be better at. Um, What's also missing when the boards are not as diverse is you just have a vicious cycle of the same networks recycling over and over into the organizations. And you never, you know, the conversation is also is always, how do we broaden that? Well, we have the same people coming to our dinners every year. So we're gonna call on the same people we do every year. And we're gonna ask the same board members to do the same things every year. How do we break out of that cycle and how do we do that? You have to be intentional and focused on, in, in how you do that. Um, and ultimately, uh, when you have a diverse board and diverse uh, individuals, you broaden and enrich the perspectives throughout the organization. So when you're talking about everything from strategy 
to tactics, to where you're granting, to what communities you're granting to, the broader and diverse the perspectives you have, the better it's going to be for the community and the individuals um, you're trying to serve. And it's, I mean, you, you sort of nail it with those voyeuristic trips, right? Like, because, you know, let's get past, you know, the, the rooted, like, sort of the inauthentic nature of it to begin with. You don't even get the authentic experience of going to that thing because there's a guy like me that got there an hour before you and cleaned it up and picked up the trash and told everybody like you know wipe the food off the side of your face right like it, it, it's like the most inauthentic thing possible so yeah it's um i hear you so M marco like so now let's sort of get at it a little bit more like when you've been in leadership roles at an organizations that have sort of taken this on and started to try and build a more diverse board you know what are the steps that that that, that you can take and and what are the challenges people can expect to run into as, as they, particularly as they look at the board, as they try and build a more diverse board? Yeah, I think it's uh, a, a couple of thoughts come to mind. I mean, uh, it's certainly a challenge um, uh, uh, that, that, that many, many organizations face in the sector. So uh, sadly, again, I think there's not necessarily an easy solution, but, but um, there are sort of um, um, some things folks can do. It's, it, it requires some sort of deep and intensive work and, and, and some time. Excuse me. So the first is is a point Elliot just made, right? Which is, folks, the organization all from all sides, the organization needs to think very creatively about expanding its network. It needs to go beyond its usual suspects, and it needs to reach out to new folks. Boiling it down, at the end of the day, these board members, it's all about sort of the human dynamic of of, of relationships and communities, right? And so truly like it's not just a question and because i think that's part of the challenge right is that folks sort of say we need a diverse board like we need some names right just give us some names and like that's all it'll take right and it's like you need the names you need to introduce yourself to the names you need those names the people behind those names to actually get to know you and trust you and like you and your organization and its mission and to then find the time in their lives to actually dedicate right and so realizing when you really again it's not rocket science but realizing when you break it down to that level, it's not a simple question of like, it's an honor for any, in this case, person of color, in my case, a person of color to join our board. And therefore, like the fact that we find them and someone refers us to them, our work should be done. Um, rather, uh, it's a question of like, you've got to actually authentic relationships as well, along with authentic uh, uh, experiences. And that's a piece of the puzzle, again, that I think people miss out on. You, and again, it's, it's actually for the greater good in myriad ways beyond just helping to diversify the board and that like everyone's lives will be enriched if there are actual real relationships and that's how you get to, and much like with every other, other piece, you've got to remember also that like if you need a new, if you want at least one board member, like just talking to three people is probably really high stakes right you probably should be no 10 or 20 people to draw from and one or two of them will everything will line up perfectly where they're the right fit and they've got the time and they've got the interest and da 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 right and so um so that's again i think where you people have to realize like you really have to cast a much wider net than folks have and then again it's not just a question of generating a list of names but actually going out and building relationships with a minimum with those people and again if you have relationships with those people they may also be able to refer you to their friends so that's just another way it helps. The, the other thing I was going to say is um, also like we have to remember the reality within which we're all working and, 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 and living, right? And so the reality is there are other larger societal forces that have led to the reality of the fact that particularly when we're talking about people of color, there are fewer of them who are wealthy because let's be honest, right? Many of the times people want people with financial wherewithal to be on their boards. There simply are fewer, right? And then again, we know the reasons why, and let's not blame the, the victims in this case, that it's not the individual people of color who are somehow less successful. It's the fact that they've been systematically um, um, deprived of being able to build wealth. But so, so again, so understanding, remembering that, lest we sort of choose, uh, uh, judge the folks who are perhaps less financially successful, um, realize that there are fewer of them to call on. And so a creative solution is, Think about actually different ways and get a little creative about ways in which people can contribute to your board. As we were just saying, there is obviously the, the standard, the conventional model of the, the donor is wealthy and or has wealthy friends and that's what they bring to the table on being on your board. But there are also donors who might actually really know your program well or really know your population well and that insight and that perspective should have 
I would argue, similar, if not equal value to simply dollars and resources. If you think about it in the sense of what will help our organization achieve its goal, what will help our organization achieve its mission and be more successful and effective with our results and our outcomes, this may be as sometimes maybe even more important if you don't have a challenge with your funding pipeline, this might be even more important in terms of doing the work you, you uh, have committed yourselves to do to do well. And so that's a piece that I found boards have been effective of sort of saying, we're gonna not just take wealthy people, but we're gonna take people with wealth or expertise, people who can give you know, not just treasure, but also time to the organization and their wisdom and their insight. Well, and I think too, it gets to sort of a little bit more of that sort of authentic conversation and authentic need too of like, you can't just want somebody on your board because they're a person of color, right? I can't just like, oh, well, you know, that would, like if I were to, if you came to me and wanted me on your board and I asked you why, like if the answer is like, oh, because you're black, like, well, then not, I want to be- Because they make the pictures right. better on our website. Right, exactly, right. right. Like, <laughs> but like, right, you have to know why that person should be on your board regardless yeah. of what they look like. And then, you know, that, that opens up a broader spectrum. But again, there's also plenty of wealth that looks in lots of different ways. So yep. I think also what your board needs at any given time evolves. Um, yep. But again, once you recognize that you're going to just get better answers with a different set of people around the table, you're yep. already, you know, now that's what you need. Um, yep. So Elliot, to share our strength, you know, the, the board sort of, uh, that's become a, the diversity of the board has become a stronger priority over the last few years. Um, how is the board sort of, rising to that, you know, what sort of conversations, you know, are happening in the organization that, that, that are sort of feeding that as a, as a priority that may be able to be realized? Well, I mean, I, I, the first thing that we had to acknowledge is that it is a concern and you have to call it out. Uh, the diversity of our board was nowhere in, where in, in, in the calling it, making it an intentional focus uh, has to be what you do, sort of number one. Number two, um, we really begun to challenge our current board members to think about their networks in a broader way. Sometimes when you think about uh, a referral for a board colleague, the default probably is, well, let me think about my best friend. Let me think about the, my colleague at work or my peer at work. And often cases, those networks are going to be the same networks that you know, are predominantly white. So we are challenging them to think more broadly. Are there community leaders where you live that you can be thinking about? Are there folks that you maybe had a business partnership that you don't work with on a day-to-day -day basis, but you've gotten to know and got to connect with? Think about your network in a broader and a more creative way. Um, I think the other thing that the board and our staff is also challenging us to do is internally to be thinking more about our own messaging and storytelling. How are we positioning the donor in our story? How are we positioning children in our story? Are we taking a racial equity lens in all of the messaging and assets and storytelling that we have in our organization? Um, that is a charge that we're very serious about and the board is very serious about. Um, and the other piece, there are many, but the other piece that I, um, want to call out is our efforts and focus on amplifying data. For instance, one of the things we know is that the impact of COVID has a disproportional impact on people of color. Um, two times of, of Black and Latino individuals are in, in danger of facing hunger than th their white counterparts. And so we're very focused on amplifying data uh, and being very clear about the how this pandemic has exacerbated so many issues. One of the things we've been doing very specifically is taking an equity, developing an equity dashboard, even from the standpoint of, Kelly mentioned the grants that we are disseminating over the last seven months, over $27 million. But we have made a specific effort that 60% of all those grants have gone to communities serving large amounts of families of color. And almost a third of those have gone to schools and community organizations that are serving Hispanic communities. And so um, we are very focused on making these intentional efforts and the board is in, in full support. Again, as I said, we have a lot of work to do, but we think all of these things in conjunction uh, will move us forward. I love that idea of sort of driving it with data, right? Like, I mean, that's sort of like the, <clears throat> we talk about that a lot as a firm, right? Like you can argue a lot of opinions and surely I'm the first to do so, but like, you know, that the, the facts are going to be what the facts are. 
Exactly. I think that's that, that, that's fantastic. Um, so obviously, like getting more diverse candidates, getting them onto your board with the right sort of mindset, um, you know, that's step one. But then actually having a board, just like you would with a staff or anywhere else, that's actually inclusive and sort of fosters somebody feeling like they are part of the team and can contribute equally. Um, you know, in some ways, sort of that revolving door that you mentioned earlier, Marco, like, what does an inclusive board look and feel like, Marco? Like, in your experience, where, where have you seen, like, all right, this is a board where not only have they gotten diverse candidates, but then they've actually made it sort of work in an equitable and inclusive way? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, trying to avoid background noise. Um, so th this... Uh, I've got just a quick thought on this. I mean, I, I want to acknowledge it from what I've seen and heard and so on. I think that we have to just realize that um, it's a, it's a different dynamic with boards. One, essentially the power dynamic and the fact that, 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 that they are the board that they're sort of ultimately in charge and, and within the organization, they don't answer to anyone but themselves. Whereas the staff always answer up to somebody up through, right? The executive director answers to the board. Um, and on top of that, like they themselves are usually fairly powerful and influential people. They're usually leaders in their own spaces with their own expertise. And then like to cap it off, they're volunteers, right? They're not on the clock. They're not paid to be there. They're essentially there by choice. So it's very hard to get them to do things they either don't want to do or that, that, that make them uncomfortable, right? And so you find, I think, some fairly robust pushback um, from that crowd at times, at least again, I've, I've seen and heard stories, um, uh, comments from, from colleagues. Um, with all of that said, so I think what, what, what that turns into then is that the journey takes longer. The journey needs to be sort of more careful. Um, often, it's, it's a fairly often um, uh, common uh, phenomena that the staff, if you will, will be ar arguably, quote unquote, further along on the journey of DEI than the board of directors and that they need to be sort of caught up, right? Um, but thankfully, I think the one thing I would say is that like there are now finally, I would argue, uh, uh, finally experts, if you will, there are finally trainers, there are finally facilitators, there are finally programs and models that actually can help bring a board along. And that's essentially what I would argue you need. What you need is the organization needs to make the commitment to sort of say, we want to get better at this and we're going to invest the time and often the resources needed to do so, to bring in a trainer, to have the conversation, right? Because a training on DEI, your typical training on DEI that can be applied to staff, sometimes is, it needs to be tweaked a fair amount to actually be uh, uh, directed or delivered to a board of directors. Uh, but again, there are people who've now begun to sort of realize and specialize that and factor in the power dynamic and the reluctance and so on. It's, it's, it's like with all things, they're, they're a slightly tougher audience, uh, but it can be done. So that, in my mind, that's sort of the advice I would have is that realize that it's going to take longer, um, but realize that, it, that it's needed. And again, and what you need is the organization to, to be willing to make the commitment to, to dedicate some of its time, whether it be a board retreat or board meetings, et cetera, to actually go through the process, which sometimes is often even the hardest part, right? Is that unlike staff, board members are like, I don't have all day to do an all day thing or to do a multi-session uh, uh, training with a facilitator. So you've got to get that, find a way to, to, to work that in. Well, and I think to the earlier point around like what's different in this moment, like I see a little bit of yeah. like that willingness that to get is much different than it was, right? Like exactly. yeah, a year ago, even yeah. tell a staff they were going to spend three days together, you get a lot of eye rolls. I think now people are, are a little more there for it. And, um, and the one thing I would say on that front is that I think the, the, the stance I find, which again is, is promising and people need to remember is that now there's, it's not so much inquiry. That's the word. Um, now there's interest in understanding. And so you, that's the window of like helping people understand, like, because frankly, like you said, like some folks, I, I'm, in fact, I know for a fact, some folks were like, what is going on? Right, like the the, 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 the uprisings and the, and the social action that happened in cities all over the country, people are like, I wanna understand what this all means, right? And that's your window to have to start to crack open that conversation. Yeah. And, and I think the fact that the conversation is now so much more pervasive because of, like the chances that, yep. you know, Kelly board member is also involved in the same conversation and her like yes. professional life is yes. dramatically higher than it was, you know, just, yeah, just I, months ago. Yeah, I joke with people that, and the nonprofit sector is a good place for that, right? Because we're actually very good about following the rules and like HR and EEO and all that stuff. And I sort of joke with folks that I'm like six months and certainly a year ago, 
like if you were in at your job at a nonprofit or, and I would argue in a board meeting too, and someone was like racism, people would be like, where's HR? Wait a minute. Like we'll, we'll bring in a trainer. Like we can't have like, right. This is a conversation that's not relevant to the mission or something like people would just get freaked out. Whereas now, like you can't not have that come up at some point. Cause like you said, it's pervasive. People have come to realize like it's a part of our American society. It's not something you can compartmentalize and say, save that for offline or for the retreat. Right, or that whole idea of like, well, this is a place of business. That's not where we address exactly. things. It's like, no, no, this is exactly where we address things. Like yep, that. yep. Um, let's shift a little bit to sort of staff teams, um, you know, to sort of the Wells Fargo example from earlier, right? That like, oh, there aren't qualified candidates. Like, I mean, Elliot, how have you built teams in your, in your career um, with an eye towards like, no, I want the best, most diverse team possible? Um, there's a question even in the chat of like, you know, where, where do I, where, where should I be looking to find the right sort of candidates? Um, but I don't know, how, how have you built your fundraising teams in, uh, in, in, in a diverse way through your career? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, we should all know about mute at this point. Um, I think the challenge uh, in hiring, fundraising, and nonprofit staff is that Many of us have been constrained by the buckets. I need to have somebody that has seven to 10 years of major gift level experience. I need to have somebody that is experienced in writing case statements. And it has boxed us in, in our ability to think a little bit more creatively about what the role needs or what the role uh, is required. One of the things we, I know, and many of us as development and fundraisers know, is that philanthropy is about connecting an individual to purpose. Aligning values. That work, that work can include individuals of all backgrounds if you have the ability to do that. So you want people that can create those powerful relationships. To me, you know, someone could have seven or so years of major gift expertise, but they might not have a, a strong ability to do that. You have to look at things more broadly. Um, one of the things we've been looking at a lot um, is thinking about the concept of white dominant culture and how it shows up in a nonprofit and not just the workplace in general. And I, I, I recommend anyone take a look at some of this research. Timmy Okun and Kenneth Jones has put together some compelling piece about white dominant culture and two things that I will call out specifically that they call out is the superiority of the nonprofit written word and how that is viewed in organizations. If it's not written, that is not valued. If it's not standard English um, or is not conforming to the way in which we need to talk about it, then it's incorrect. Where let's flip that dynamic to say that all forms of communication are valued and taken seriously. It may not be the way that you write it, but if it's getting the point across and it is compelling, then we need to think about our team and our staff that, from that standpoint. The other piece that I thought was really compelling about it too is how we view organizational titles versus experience in many nonprofit organizations. Um, sometimes the default, just because someone has a certain level of title, that we're automatically going to say, brilliant idea, that's great, let's give them a viewpoint to have that thought, when there might be skills, experience, and things that people that may not have that title can bring to the table. We have to create an environment where that's open, where that's welcome, and there's not this hierarchical, uh, we want people to bring their full breadth of talents and skills into the organization regardless of title. And so, Sometimes the deep hierarchical um, framework in many organizations is a barrier to making it as inclusive as possible. So those are those are a few things. And I think, yeah, this idea of like we need seven years of this type of experience. I mean, like don't don't tell any of my clients this, but like fundraising isn't rocket science, right? Like it, it's a lot more art than it is science. And right, you could be great at it and have no experience, or you could be terrible at it and have 20 years worth of experience. Um, so I think that, that that's super important. Um, Mark, I want to touch a little bit on an idea of um, uh, first, I, I first came up on it, a new profit when you were leading this sort of capitalizing diverse leaders work. You've seen, particularly in the last few months, tons of foundations, lots of other organizations funding social entrepreneurs kind of come to this. Um, 
But talk to me a little bit about, you know, where have there been barriers uh, to philanthropy for organizations with leaders of color? And how do you think that sort of plays out into this whole, whole, whole dynamic and sort of keeps it going? Yeah, so um, the, the thing we stumbled, and it's funny because the way we got to it at New Profit, I think is a, worth, a worthy kind of example, right? Case study or cautionary tale or something that the organization, it's a grant making organization, it's a venture philanthropy, and it was getting some critiques about the diversity of its grantee base. And so they sort of said, oh, that's a legitimate concern, like a, a, an issue, let's, let's look at why that is and let's figure it out, right? And so of course the first step was like, we just need more diverse applicant pool because we don't have enough diverse applicants, right? And then they started to look and they're like, oh, we actually do have diverse applicants, um, <laughs> but somehow they're not getting selected, right? And they're like, well, why are they not getting selected? Oh, well, like it's a capacity question, right? They don't have enough capacity. So they're like, we then need to go out and actually do some training and build up some, some supports and point to some programs that help build capacity among some of these leaders and direct them to that to get there, right? But then we sort of hear, heard back from some of the, those uh, participants who were sort of like, yeah, it's not the capacity question. Like, like that's not why you're turning us down, right? And they, anyway, all of which is to say they unpacked and unpacked and unpacked, peeled back the layers of the onion to sort of realize that there was a fundamental challenge in that in philanthropy, I would argue, much like we were saying about the nonprofit sector, which holds itself to a higher standard and prides itself on that. Everyone absolutely talked about a commitment to diversity, but pretty shockingly, um, and which is in some ways I'd like to think part of why you're now seeing this proliferation of, of, of reports and studies and statements from, from philanthropy, people weren't measuring their own results. People, we would say to foundations, we went to several and sort of said, okay, you're committed to diversity. We see that on your website. It's in your mission state, et cetera. Um, how many of your grantees are led by people of color? And they'd be like, we don't know. We don't ask them that, right? We're like, we're not sure it's appropriate to ask. And we're like, well, you clearly got to unpack some stuff because if you're not even going to ask, then like you're never going to know. And then when we finally did start packing and asking, the, sh the, the short version is the number we used are sort of, you know, power pitch stat was 30% of the United States population are African American and or Latino. 10% of nonprofit organizations are led by African Americans and or Latinos. So they're underrepresented in leadership. But what's even worse, 4% of the charitable giving dollars go to those organizations led by uh, an African American and or a Latino, right? And so not only are we underrepresented in leadership, those few who are in leadership are dramatically under-resourced. So no wonder capacity is a question. No wonder they're not getting the grants. And what's even worse is that led us, like I said, to look at philanthropy and discover that um, when folks looked at their own grantee base, it was pretty surprising to learn that uh, patterns emerge that the leaders of color in their grantee, not to mention, not only were they, at best they were doing that 10% of their grantees, right, based on the number. So in theory, that's good, but it basically just maintains the status quo. Um, but what's worse than that was those grantees were getting uh, shorter term loans rather than multi-year grants, uh, loans, sorry, grants, shorter term grants than multi-year grants. They were getting uh, 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 a percentage less in grant dollars than their peers, than the equivalent uh, grantees in the same uh, grantee pool, and often with more restrictions than their peers. Fewer were getting general support uh, or unrestricted funds than their same peers in the same applicant pool, right? And so those were some of the challenges we realized that, again, helped us to explain and tell the story, which is that this stuff happens at a systemic level. This stuff happens with biases that are often completely unconscious and unintentional, but that still play out. And that only with concerted action and tracking the numbers and holding yourselves to a truly high standard, having rigor was a word we used to like to throw out a lot uh, around your metrics is the only way we're going to change this within your own grant making and more importantly, to actually make any kind of real difference in society, which is what you claim to do, right? And that was really the, the eye opener that again, we, we found that really needs to be talked about more. And again, we're quite happy that is happening that conversation is growing so much more. And as a minor plug to my old employer's new profit, the, the effort is now called Inclusive Impact. It's still going and folks can reach out to them and, and learn more about the latest on that work, which is about trying to drive dollars ultimately to those organizations to actually help close that particular disparity. Thanks, Marco. And I want to stay on the thread of driving dollars to organizations for a second and talk about building diverse um, pipelines of donors and you know, on, on this topic, there's a, a couple, I think, threads that I've been hearing a lot about, um, it, which is this myth of donors of color being sort of a new and emerging audience, um, which, again, very much a myth, but that's what's been, per, uh, that's what's prevailed. Um, 
in combination with the fact that um, you know fundraising for so long, I think, has relied on some really sort of outdated and traditional strategies geared towards frankly, white heterosexual men, because that's what donor bases looked like for so long. And so you think you see things like, you know, really like peer to peer fundraising, um, competition, naming opportunities, getting a board seat because you've made a really large gift. Um, and so when you think about those two sort of um, prevailing attitudes and strategies, I wanted to, Elliot, first ask you, um, you know, have you encountered those views and what advice do you have for, you know, overcoming them um, in your fundraising efforts? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. You certainly have uh, encountered those views. I think one way to overcome that is you have to have culturally intelligent staff that is doing, for instance, the prospect research. We know that many individuals of color um, might hold wealth in different ways. And you have to be open to being creative and searching for how to find that and, and where that information is. Um, a lot, we are become so reliant on maybe two to three sources where we do our prospect research. We should broaden sort of the view and sort of where we look for philanthropists of color. Um, are other institutions that these kind of philanthropists are supporting? How do we broaden sort of that base of sources that we use? Um, a key point goes back to what we talked about with boards. How you get new prospects, how you get a lot of new champions to your cause is by leveraging your volunteer leadership. And so the composition of that falls exactly into how do you broaden that base? And so those are a couple of things. Um, we're also beginning to think about, you know, are there ways that we can mine our own database to find, we, you know, many of us probably have a diverse population of individuals and we just don't know it. Is there some surveying that we can be doing of our current database that uh, is reasonable, that makes sense, uh, that we can just learn more about uh, the donors and the folks that are supporting. So those are a couple of things that, that we're kind of thinking about. And uh, so drawing back to something um, that came up earlier, the idea of data and using data to keep, you know, keep us accountable. Um, how is Share Our Strength starting to use data and, you know, metrics to really track some of those steps that you're making now and creating that more diverse space? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I alluded to it very specifically, but I think um, every decision that we're making is um, based off of data. And as I mentioned, sort of this uh, equity dashboard that we're creating from the standpoint of our grant making in communities, it is driven by what we're seeing in community and where the greatest need is. And I think we're going to do that across the board, not only from the standpoint of how we do our grant making, but from the standpoint of how we identify and how we are prospecting for, for new people. Great. And are there any particular resources that, um, other than, you know, making the decision that this is a priority for us and we're going to think and act differently, um, but other sort of resources that you've uncovered that could be useful to organizations to help them in their um, effort to do this? Um, I don't know, like different research yeah. tools or databases, anything like that? Yep. Yeah, let me... Let me get back to sort of our prospect research team because I know that okay. they're, they've uncovered several sources mm -hmm. and maybe that we can do that sort of in a follow up email. Oh, sure, them. sure. That, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Marco, at, at, at New Profit and um, at the Institute and any other organizations you've worked with, how have you um, made it a strategy to tap more into networks of donors of color because I, you know, we talked a lot about how you start with the network you have and build from there. Um, so how have you approached, you know, just thinking about not just starting with one donor here and one donor there, but really going into a larger network to try to build momentum that way of um, donors of color. Yeah, I mean, so I think uh, a couple of thoughts come to mind on that front. I, I, one, I think is Again, this idea about sort of if, if, if you base it on authentic relationships and you reach out and you start to build a strong connection, that, that's the other thing as uh, part of that parcel of that story is that while there are fewer, um, uh, relatively speaking, uh, fewer um, potential donors of color, folks who have the means to do so, 
Um, because of that fact, like there's a much more, um, there are many more social ties among them, right? So they actually, a lot more of them know each other um, if they move in similar circles, if, if for no other reason, sadly, then again, they've found themselves being among the few in their space, in their field, who've reached their levels, right, of success and so on, and or when they're looking for competitors. Um, and so, so there is some familiarity, there's some experience, not to mention sometimes, again, folks have partnered together and worked together and achieved success and therefore, again, are friends, right? And so uh, engaging that contact and that relationships, own network of relationships is one way to sort of, again, broaden the pool. And again, if they sincerely care about what you do and the work you do and so on, they'll be happy to bring their friends to the table to, to join in that conversation. Um, the only other thought I would say, the thing I think that I've seen that has some uh, a benefit back to the point about sort of the approach um, to, to cultivating the donor, if you will, is um, another component I think underneath a lot of it, I would say has been often the, the as I mentioned earlier, right, sometimes impolitely referred to as sort of the savior complex, right? This idea that the donors giving, in addition to the naming rights and all those kinds of things, um, the donors giving those less fortunate, right? Is, is helping out those folks who've been underprivileged and under resources and who have not had the same successes in life as the, as the donor. Um, whereas I think often to giving to, to, to or, or, or uh, engaging and cultivating potential donors of color, it's actually sometimes more of an empowerment and a giving back kind of message and model. This idea of sort of saying, give to the other communities from which you came, um, whether directly or symbolically um, uh, uh, or metaphorically, uh, and to give to the people in that community who, but for societal barriers and systemic racism and other things, could potentially have had the same success you have, which is a very different approach than simply saying, poor them, right? Like in my mind, it's sort of saying, give other people some of the opportunities that you were lucky enough to have and or that you found through your own uh, uh, grit and hard work that other folks simply have not been able to access, who've been prevented from accessing, right? Just, just that language alone, I find creates a very different reaction from a, from a, a potential donor and sponsor. And then if, of course, certainly, um, which happened, I think more and may still happen, but I think happens a little less among um, the classic sort of archetypal white donor that I think still happens quite a bit among the donor of color is, um, is, is that personal experience, right? Is sort of, again, uh, drawing them to uh, giving to an organization that's serving people that they can see themselves in, right? That they feel like that could have been me when I was a kid and therefore, right? And that's a different dynamic than saying those poor folks over there, please give, right? I think of the, 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 the cliche is often always, right? The, the, the weekend uh, uh, television, which again, that's showing my age that it's still television, but uh, the, the television infomercials, right? That were like, please send a dollar to help this person who was in the most dire situation. And it was like, not even really, it was almost dehumanizing, the, right? As opposed to being like, this is a community just like yours and why don't you help make it super powerful and competitive and, and attractive and, 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 and a ha happy place to be, right? And that is a different model than the other. No. <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, and I think the good thing is you're starting to see those practices become best practice in fundraising, right? Like we're moving away from like the Oh, just, you know, show the, the child in the river with, you know, no pants on, you know, looking for water. And we're moving to like, no, let's authentically talk about what the challenge here and why does that community not have water and yours does? Um, but anyway, we've sort of come to the, the end here. So that there's a ton of great questions we could keep going with. Um, but we're going to sort of round to the, the close here. I would say, you know, Marco, Elliot, thank you for being with us. Thank you for being resources that we've been able to draw upon. Thank you for being resources for the nonprofit sector and our community today. Um, thank you to everybody for joining. Uh, only my mother-in-law and the Joe Biden campaign call my home phone. So anyway, we didn't answer that. But uh, uh, thank you guys really for everything and for everybody for being here. I would say, you know, we'll continue to have conversations. You're going to get a survey, participants. If you have topics for future dialogues, please let us know. Um, you're also going to get notice soon of the next sort of series of, of conversations we're going to have, which will be around sort of mega philanthropy um, with some really dynamic speakers. Um, but uh, appreciate everybody being here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I don't know. Be careful out there. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.